Hello, Rana. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you too? I'm great. I'm great. Okay, I've been looking forward to this moment. So let's start. Tell me about yourself. So I'm um, Rona Biu from Ghana. I'm a clinical psychologist by profession. And I work with the Human Trafficking Secretariat. I'm there as a psychologist and a shelter manager. So we have a shelter for rescue traffic uh, victims. We have both adult and children's shelter. So I manage the children's shelter. You manage the children's shelter? Yes, yes, and you're also a psychologist? A clinical psychologist, yes, please. So you provide therapy? Psychosocial, exactly. For all of the children? For all the children. So it depends. So we have um, social workers who work with them. They do counseling for them as well. So if they identify that they are children who have some issues that is beyond them as uh, social workers, then it's being referred to me. How many children are taken uh, care of by the, the shelter? Okay, so the shelter capacity is 32. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a temporary place where you're supposed to be there for a maximum of three months. But most of the time, because of delays at the court system, some can stay there for six months, sometimes eight months, and over a year. So we have two, one for adults and one for children. That's government-owned. But we also have some NGOs who also run similar shelters. And is there enough capacity for the need? We don't have enough for now, but that's what we have. We are managing, because that's what the government can provide for now. We are in the process of procuring another one, which they've started with a renovation in a different region. So what I'm, I'm running is at the, uh, the capital city, and they'll be able to uh, re, uh, re, uh, refurbish another one at a different region. So we are hoping that we can get shelters in all the 16 regions that we have in the country. As a clinical psychologist, how would you assess the state of the mental health of children that are referred to the shelter, how do they arrive? So when they come, actually the police, immigration or NGOs brings them to the shelter. So it depends on who brings them. When they come, what we do is we first do needs assessment for them. Most, in most cases, the day that they arrive, we are supposed to organize for them to be sent to the hospitals for medical screening. Then after that, we do needs assessments. They come with no dress on, some, they are not wearing any slippers, so we are supposed to provide all those basic necessities for them. So after the needs assessments, they are being welcomed to the shelter, given something to eat and being shown to their place to go and have a rest. Then the next day, we take, we have uh, some uh, notes that we take, we call it case management notes. So it's, it has to do with everything concerning a particular victim. So for example, we take the history where you are coming from, uh, your, your family members, if you remember their names, if you have their contacts, we try and get them. In most cases, they're not able to tell us their contacts, but some they are able to. And they come in groups. Hardly will you get one person coming. Most of the time, it's either five, six, or ten. Then they come, some they are siblings. So if we have an older one, he or she is able to give us some details about their family members. And then we try and after um, um, assessing them, knowing their needs, then we, uh, we do their psychological assessment as well. So if you find out that they have any psychological problem, then we usually do individual uh, um, therapy for them, depending on whatever case that they have. So we start with individual therapy, and after the therapy, we realize that maybe they are healing, their healing process is better. Then we can group those with similar issues and then we, we run group therapy for them as well. Most of the cases that I've handled so far, they come with trauma. And the trauma, most of them, they have anxiety, they have a stress-related issue, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. Some also have depression, especially those who are at the sea, who are being sent to the lakeside to do fishing, they come with problem, sleep problems. They find it difficult sleeping. But some of them tell you they are scared, they can't sleep when they sleep because they've heard stories and they've seen some of them falling into the water and not coming back. So sometimes they find it difficult sleeping. So basically that's most of the psychological problems that I've encountered so far. So stress, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety and fear. 
and sleep problems. What's the age range of most of the children that you see? So it's from six years to 18. And most of the time, who are the perpetrators? The perpetrators can be anybody. But in most cases, it's uh, more or less like a family related. They'll tell you, I know this person is my long distance kind of thing. So I gave my child to him or her to go and stay with. And then the, the alleged perpetrators, I would say alleged because sometimes if not really finished with the case. So the alleged perpetrators tell them that um, they are going to provide them education, they're going to give them the best education that they wanted, but they end up being used for a different purpose. So it can be anybody, a family member, it can even be the parents themselves. Because there's been cases that parents were involved. They are those who gave their children out to be used as whatever that they were using them for. Because they couldn't feed them. There are so many children on them, they've given birth to more than they can cater for. So when they are more on them, the best thing is to give some out. If you come and tell them, I want to take care of your child, because the burden on them is too much, they'll quickly just give you out for you to go and take care of the kid. But they don't know whether it is really what they claimed they were going to use them for, it's what they're using them for. So the perpetrator can be anybody, like I said. How long have you been at the shelter? So I've been working with the secretariat for the, the past six years. So that's where I've been. Actually, it's a home, so that's why I, I, I live as well. I'm the How manager, so I'm supposed to be there 24 7, yes. So you live with the I, children? I live with the children. Of course, I have my own apartment anyway, but I'm it's on the same compound, compound. yes. For so sometimes you'll be sleeping and they'll be knocking at your door. It's not easy. This work is not easy. So you being a, a center manager and being there with them, a shelter manager and being there with them, it's not easy. Most of the cases, you have to forego your own and take care of a victim because uh, it's part of your work. Why do you keep doing it? Because it's not, I, it's, I, not just, it's not just a job. I love the work I do. I love being with children. That's my passion. I just love being with children. When I'm there with them and I see smiles on their face, I become happy. Because usually when I record the before and the after, I realize at least I've done something and that's a lot of accomplishment for me. But when they come, you see their situation, you wouldn't like it. But when they are going, you see that, yes, you've done something. Somebody will, will tell you, ah, madam, I'm so happy that I've been here because because of you, I'll go back to school because they were canceled. They didn't know the importance of education. But after leaving the shelter, they felt empowered. And yes, it is good for me to be in school. So that alone makes me happy. I know it's stressful, but I just love what I'm doing. So Rana, can you tell me of a story that um, of an engagement, uh, a particular relationship, a particular moment where um, either the joy or the challenge of, of living in the shelter, living with these children um, and being there every day sort of hit home for you. Yes, there's one particular case that I don't think I can ever forget. Uh, there was one afternoon, one of the boys walked out to me, came to my office immediately after lunch, wanting to know when he'll be going home. This boy I've worked with, he's been in the shelter for more than three months. Because I remember initially I said the maximum is three months, but because of code delays, sometimes you can extend to that. So he's been there for more than three months. He wanted to know when he'll be going home. After telling him that um, it will take a while because he knows the court, the case in court, it will take a while, so you should exercise patience. He got so angry, he got up and told him, Madam, this case, I'm tired. And we've been up and down with this case. Today we'll go to court again, tomorrow this. The next time they will tell you, Madam, don't bring the victim again because the, the, the judge is not around. So we have to hold on. So this boy gave me a warning that if nothing is being done about it, then he will deal with me. Like he threatened me actually. And looking at the boy standing there, looking at my height, I will see, yes, if you really want to do something to me, he can. So he just walked out after seeing whatever he wants to see. He walked out. So that's one of the cases. There are so many instances. There was one particular one. I think I remember saying earlier that sometimes you have to forgo your own and take care of a, a, a survivor at the shelter. There was one who came, but he was ready to go. Fortunately, he was repeated, but he was still ready to go. He has that zeal to go back to school and he was placed back to the school system. 
So we do follow up. When we go, when we read together, we don't leave them like that. We go back for a follow up, check up how he's doing. And then if we need to help them, okay, not financially because it's done once. I have to be specific because we don't have that much fun. So when we so give you, it's once. But we want it at least if the child needs something in school, we can try and get that one for the child. But setting up the family is done once. Is that something that you're proud of? I am. I'll be able to help somebody to become, to, to who is likely to become somebody in future. Because I can't say to become. He's likely to become somebody in future because you know education is everything. Absolutely. Just education, as they say, is the key to success. Absolutely. So, yes, I'm That's proud amazing. of that. That's amazing. Well, my last question for you is, Rana, what are you in service of? Sorry, can you repeat the question? What are you in service of? What am I in service of? Um, I don't know if I understand your question correctly, but I'm providing help for the vulnerable. I'm trying to make them a better person than they used to be when they were with their alleged traffickers. I want to help them overcome the trauma that they might have experienced with their alleged trafficker to put them in a state where they will be able to do things for themselves, stand up for them so they'll be empowered so that they will not end up being re-trafficked again. So that's my work. Thank you. You're welcome. This is perfect. <laughs>